Okay. We're good. Hello, this is Fred Clare, celebrating the Dodgers trip to the World Series, and you're listening to From the Heart, presented by Orange Kiwi. Thank you, Fred. It's such an honor to, to get a chance to speak with you and to, to do this as we're embarking on uh, the 2020 World Series with our Dodgers. It's pretty exciting. So for my listeners, this is now uh, the From the Heart podcast episode number 42. And uh, it wasn't planned this way, and it, things just kind of work out. And number 42, for those of you who know, was the number of the legendary Jackie Robinson, who uh, obviously not only is a Hall of Famer and a great Dodger, but a pioneer, obviously, is the first black baseball player in Major League Baseball. And with Fred, I know, and, and I want to get into your accolades and background, but I can't not go here first. And as you and I talked about, you you had some experience with Jackie Robinson and with all that's been going on in our society today with the, the racial unrest and all the tension and everything else. And just the, the, the beautiful story that Jackie Robinson was. What can you tell us? I know you were with Jackie on his last uh, public appearance back in 1972. What can you tell us about the man, Jackie, and some of your experiences with him? Well, first of all, it could not be more appropriate than for me to be here, to have the honor to be here on your 42nd uh, uh, edition of your show. Thank you. Uh, and it brings to mind um, uh, when I first met Dr. Foreman, uh, one of the leaders, as you probably know, at City of Hope. And I'll never forget this because uh, Dr. Foreman, uh, with a great history and has done so much for so many, uh, and has a love for baseball. And I was aware of that when I walked into his office because there was a jersey hanging there uh, from uh, Don Baylor, who had been a friend and had been a patient of Dr. Foreman. And the first thing uh, Dr. Foreman said to me, he said, Fred, what does 42 mean to you? Hmm. And I said, well, Dr. Foreman, that's very easy. I said, yeah. uh, that, that's Jackie's number. And he said, Fred, this year, uh, when I met him, and I believe it was 2018, this will be the 42nd anniversary of our bone marrow transplant program. Wow. <laughs> uh, and would you and Cheryl uh, join us for that program? Uh, I would tell you, Ed, that that uh, not probably was, was one of the most uh, inspiring days of my life. And as uh, fate would have it and time would have it, it just so happens that I believe last week or within the last uh, week to 10 days, uh, City of Hope celebrated its bone marrow transplant program once again. And this time, there was a wonderful story in USA. Um, one of the young recipients uh, whose life was saved uh, met her donor via a Zoom call. I can't think of anything more powerful than that. And I can't think of anything more powerful than Jackie Robinson and the honor to know him and to be with him at the 1972 World Series when the commissioner Bowie Kuhn had asked Jackie to throw out the first ball. And he said, I, I will throw out the first ball if you give me the opportunity to speak, Mr. Commissioner. And Bowie said, uh, yes, we will. And Jackie spoke and it's there on YouTube and other places and people should look at it. Because Jackie was there and he was with his family. And what was really interesting also there, and I had visited with him too before the game, was Pee Wee Reese. So Jackie thanked Pee Wee and called Pee Wee the leader of our team. And he thanked Mr. Ricky, who gave him a chance, and he thanked baseball. And, uh, but he made a plea, and so appropriate, again, in the time of this, that he thanked baseball. But he said, I will not be happy until I see a, I believe the word was black manager yeah. in the third base coaching box, meaning as the manager of the team. So I, I must tell you, I was rooting very hard, not only for the Dodgers and a dear friend, uh, Dave Roberts, but also for a dear old friend in Dusty Baker and how much that would have meant uh, to the two of them, more important to all of us, 
Um, but Jackie's impact on me and my life, uh, and so part of my the book uh, Extra Innings that uh, we'll talk about that gets into my journey at City Hope. But when I had a golf tournament, two golf tournaments to support City Hope, I wanted to give a trophy, uh, a, a lifetime uh, award, lifetime uh, recognition. Uh, and the first year um, we gave it to a person, a former player, I'm sure you know, Rod Carew, who has yeah. experienced so much in his life. Absolutely. And the second year we gave it to Tommy Lasorda. Uh, but the main reason for the trophy, very candidly, is I wanted a quote on that trophy. I wanted that quote to be shown. And that quote is the quote from Jackie Robinson. And that quote is, a life is not important except on the impact it has on other lives. And I can't think of a quote, I can't think of a statement more important to all of us than what that quote says, means, and represents. So um, again, a long-winded answer, uh, but such a, uh, a timely part of, um, of all that's taking place in our world today. Well, my listeners aren't here to listen to me, Fred. They're here to listen to you. So take as long as you want on every answer, please. I, I beg of you, actually, and so do they. Yeah, that quote has resonated with me. I, you can't talk about anything really Dodgers with me from Vince Scully back down to Jackie Robinson to you to just the history of the team. And I, I get emotional. And I have my friends who listen to me and know me. Um, we were at the Dodger game on Vinny's last, you know, his retirement um, party, if you will. And, and my friends looked at me and said, stop crying. And I just cry like a baby. I'm an emotional guy to begin with. And I, I like Tommy has said, bleed Dodger blue. And I'm just tickled to death to, to just hear you tell stories. And I would, I'd love to, you know, let's, let's stay on Jackie for a minute. Um, obviously major league baseball honors him typically in April, obviously this year was different for obvious reasons uh, by everyone wearing number 42, they've retired the number as well. What does that tell you about, I mean, I, I, I don't even know how to ask the question. I guess just your response to when you heard they were going to retire his number uh, that everybody in major league baseball was going to honor Jackie. It goes beyond the fact that he was the first black baseball player in the major league baseball for me, I think it goes to the person. How about you? Well, far, far beyond the playing part and um, the person who acknowledged that so readily was Martin Luther King. Yeah. And uh, so uh, to have the honor, and I've, I've said this a number of times, the greatest honor of my time with the Dodgers was to be in the company of Jackie and to um, just recognize and have a sense of who he was and who he represented. When I mentioned the 1972 World Series in Jackie's talk, Jackie's diabetes was so bad that before the game, I was there with a group who were uh, involved or related to the first ball ceremony. And uh, Peter O'Malley was there, myself representing the Dodgers and up walks this person. He gets within nearly five to seven feet of Jackie and Jackie doesn't acknowledge him. And one of Jackie's uh, friends leaned over and said, Jackie, it's Pee Wee. Hmm. Jackie's eyesight yeah. is so bad due to diabetes that he wasn't able to recognize Pee Wee and then they embraced. Jackie, after that uh, appearance at the 1972 World Series, passed away nine days later. Yeah. So in his last days, in his last breaths, he spoke to the importance of diversity. He, sp he spoke to the importance of fairness. And I just can't think of anything more powerful than what exists today. And uh, without uh, trying to get carried away in any of this, how dramatic all that is related to today. And the position that Mookie Betts took at such an important time. Yeah. And um, so I, I know what Jackie's legacy is and, and what he meant to our uh, society 
what he meant to us as human beings uh, represents so so much and uh, so I, I just think it's um, uh, the celebration of Jackie's accomplishments, what he stood for, what he wanted to uh, see um, in terms of equality, in terms of justice, uh, in terms of everything that's that's on the right side of things. And I'm so proud uh, and happy to have a such a long time relationship with Rachel Robinson. And I had a chance to uh, see Rachel a couple of years ago when the statue of Jackie uh, was dedicated <clears throat> at the Rose Bowl. I've had the honor to be on the Rose Bowl Operating Company and to be there and Vinny was the MC that day. And to be there um, with Rachel uh, meant uh, so much uh, because I've also, you know, when they talk about the retirement Jackie's number, it's, it's um, I remember being at Shea Stadium when that, uh, with Rachel, when that took place and being with Rachel at UCLA when the statue was dedicated and being with Rachel at Montreal when a statue was dedicated to Jackie. So it's not as if there haven't been tributes. They've just been so justly deserved and carry so much meaning today. You just can't honor someone or what someone stands for, put up a statue or give a trophy and forget it. It has no meaning unless we, we involved, uh, we as, uh, as citizens, as human beings, carry it on. That becomes an obligation and, yeah. and I embrace it. Yeah, it definitely is obvious that Rachel and the family and the Dodger family and the baseball family have honored that legacy in a really appropriate way. I love that even in a year of COVID where we didn't have an April 15th baseball game, they still made sure they honored Jackie during the season, I think in September or August or September. It was great that they still carried that honor on. So you've mentioned a lot of names and like I said, we could do an hour or three on Jackie and I'd be happy to do that sometime, obviously. Talk about some of the names that you've already mentioned. Um, you mentioned before, well, I'll go to Dusty Baker first. Uh, you know, obviously you were, you know, very instrumental in, in, um, in Dusty's career and you've been a, a great friend of Dusty's. And like you, I, even though there's a lot of controversy with the Houston Astros and a lot of people not probably wanting the Astros to get to the World Series for some obvious reasons, it's hard not to root for a guy like Dusty. I, that, that's why I did actually find myself being, you know, hey, if they get to the World Series, a rematch would be great. But also I really admire Dusty Baker. Talk about your relationship with Dusty and just well, how hard it would be for him to go into that situation. Well, yeah. where he, you know, I, um, I uh, remember uh, Dusty very well when he, um, uh, Al Campanis made the trade to bring Dusty uh, to the Dodgers. And, um, and you know what Dusty was as a player is what he is as a manager. You take that Dodger team, those teams of that time, Garvey, Lopes, Russell, Say, uh, Reggie, Rick Mundy, Yeager, Ferguson. Sure. The guy who kept them together, all, all of those, I can tell you chapter and verse, we could spend an hour on each other. Mm -hmm. Sure. To say the least, were different personalities in many ways about as different as you could be but when they went on that field they were one yeah. and no one and it's unusual for uh, uh, well maybe not as unusual when I think of Dusty I can almost think of Mookie in terms of a person who seems to have the ability to solidify the team that's what Dusty did as a player. And that's who Dusty has been as a manager. And that's why he was such the right person for the Astros in what they went through, which was, um, uh, I, in so many ways, um, I, I feel so sad for the players because they were so wrong. Right. As was the manager and as was the front office and what they, enabled to happen. So I, I, I feel bad, but um, that it was self-inflicted. Sure. Because there's nothing more important than any of us have, nothing, than our credibility. 
And there's nothing more important to the game than the integrity of the game. Nothing. There's not even a close second. Yeah. So Dusty, uh, <laughs> I have to tell you, well, this we've been on serious topics. So um, we're in Anaheim, spring training game. Dusty's been with us a couple of years. I'm not the general manager, it's uh, early on. So it's April the 1st. So Tommy called me in his office and he said, Fred, let's, let's have Dusty Kane come in. And I, I knew this was not going to be good. And so Dusty uh, comes into Tommy's office, Tommy being Tommy, April 1st being April the 1st. Yep. Says, Dusty, I got bad news for you. Dusty said, well, what's that T? He said, we've traded you, hmm. Camp Hannes did. Tommy, how could you? <laughs> How, how could you trade me? I love it here. I produced. And he was furious. And he said, who did you get for me? Tommy said, Boog Powell. He said, you <laughs> traded me for Boog Powell? <laughs> and I said, I, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, Dusty, Dusty. Uh, there's a big calendar on the wall. I said, check the calendar. He says, Fred, what do I care about the calendar? And I said, Dusty, it's April the 1st. And Dusty looked at Tommy, and I had to prevent him from going over to the desk. Sure. <laughs> I thought he was going to strangle him. Yeah. So um, that was Dusty. Uh, Dusty uh, could be so close to whoever, to Reggie, to Russell, to Davey, to everyone. Um, and he was such a spirit of the team. I think actually it was Dusty who was involved in one of the first high fives. Uh, that's I've heard been. that. Yeah, I've heard it attributed uh, to him. So he he is um, he meant he was the right guy. You couldn't have picked a better guy uh, because um, uh, Dusty didn't get sidetracked. Dusty was there to manage the team, to bring the team together, not to be political, not to try to to say. Uh, things that might help the situation. Dusty knew there was one thing that he told his players. You guys got to go out there, play to the best of your ability. We're going to do this with all of the integrity that we have, and we're going to let our, our, uh, our work speak for itself. So great, great memories of Dusty. Yeah. And yeah. a dear friend uh, uh, today. You're talking Charlie? To, to uh, uh, Dusty, yeah. Oh, great friend to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you. I wanted to go a few more names, but you mentioned the importance of credibility to the game. And you're one of the things that really stands out in your career is the stand you took in the 1988 playoffs. Uh, for those that don't know, I'll let Fred tell the story. And you, uh, you already know where I'm going, obviously, Fred, with Jay Howell. Yeah, we're at Shea Stadium playing the Mets in the National League Championship Series. It's towards the end of the series. It's a, it's a tough series. It's a series that we probably shouldn't even have been in because the Mets had dominated the Dodgers that year. Yet here the Dodgers are a game or two away from getting to the World Series, which they obviously eventually did and went on to win. Tell us what happened with Jay Howell and what you did after the game in the clubhouse. I just love this story. Well, it's a, um, it's a cold day at Shea Stadium, a critically um, important game for us. Uh, Jay has um, come in in relief and um, shortly uh, after he is in the game, um, Harry Wendelstead uh, comes out from behind the home plate umpire position to examine Jay's glove and then Jay is tossed out of the game. Wendelstead saw that there was pine tar there that is against the rules. It's against the written rules. Those in the game know that on cold days, a pine tar isn't going to give the ball an exceptional movement. Time tar can help with the grip that can help a guy from getting hit in the head. Maybe it sounds like I'm rationalizing this and I may be, but um, in the game itself, uh, among the players uh, who know the game, play the game, uh, but it was, uh, but anyway, uh, Wendell said threw Jay out of uh, the game. And uh, 
I didn't know, I assumed, but I didn't know for sure. I, I didn't know, I couldn't know exactly what had happened, what had been found. Uh, many things have been found in, um, in a player's glove from, uh, from tax to other things that are definitely against the rule because they definitely changed the flight of the ball. Right. But I was sitting, Cheryl and I were seated there with um, uh, Peter O'Malley uh, and his family. And the crowd began to chant uh, Dodgers cheat. I probably have never been more upset at a baseball game. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we're, we're going to lose games. We're going to lose a lot of games in a lot of years. But I'm never going to want to see us be accused as cheaters. That, that, that's not going to happen. That's yeah. unacceptable. And so I went into uh, the clubhouse after the game. I said, Tommy, you get Al and Jay, get Jay in here. You get Paranoski in here. And I'm going to tell you one thing. I don't know what the hell happened. <laughs> I want to know, but I don't know right now. But whatever the hell happened, unless we uh, tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, it's unacceptable to me. And it's, it's not going to, it's not going to fly. So I want total honesty and transparency. And we're in this together. I will accept the responsibility for whatever happened. I'm the general manager of this team. You're the manager. You're the pitching coach. You're the pitcher. We are together. Right. But we're going to be honest to the very word on what we say. And Jay was suspended for uh, two games. I appealed because I thought I had proper grounds, as I recall, and was reduced to one game. Uh, Jay actually, and we had a Zoom call recently with the 88 team. And, and in fact, Jay and I exchanged the emails just within the last few days. Uh, he, he, he felt a heavy responsibility. Sure. Uh, and just, that's part of the story never really came out. Uh, Jay uh, may have spoken to a little bit on the Zoom call because 30 years later, he felt that he had left, let the team down. <laughs> he felt that more than if he'd given up the game-winning home run because he knew it wasn't right. But we overcame it. We stayed together. And, um, and Jay was such an important part. But it's, um, it has to do with um, playing the game the right way. And... Um, my dear friend, Joey Malfitano says it best, respect the game. And, and it doesn't really, it doesn't really, uh, it still goes so far beyond baseball. Sure. That, that it becomes uh, minor in scope um, when you talk about the importance of integrity and honesty and transparency and credibility. Um, th those are the values of our, our lives, of our businesses, of everything that we do. And you set that stage as the leader of that team as well. I had an opportunity yesterday to have a, a text dialogue back and forth with my dear friend and yours, Tim Mead, now the president of the Baseball yes. Hall of Fame. Tim was on my podcast a couple of months ago as well. I've known Tim for a lot of years. And Tim described you basically, as, the way he described you on the text message yesterday was the character that you display. And I'm not going to embarrass you with the words that Tim used because they were great. But the way you handled that situation in 1988 is exactly how someone who was described by Tim would normally handle it. So kudos to you for taking the integrity of the game over and above the results of the game. And that, that's, that's more important, as you say. Tell us a little bit about that 88 team. I don't want to, you know, I want to get into the bulk of our conversation about you and the battles you've been through and, and the book and City of Hope, because that's why we're here today. But if you could just well, tell us. I think of 88. And uh, I think to this recent call that we had, I think of the reunion that we had in 2018, 30 years. And the most amazing thing, it was surreal. We had the reunion in the stadium club at Dodger Stadium. Players came in. You would almost have thought they had been in that dugout down there mm -hmm. the night before. There was such a bond that exists with that team. And yes, a world championship team. So one might say that all world championships have that. 
I don't know that. Yeah. I know this. I know in that team, the bond is so strong with those players that it brought tears to their eyes and tears to all of our eyes. Um, and even on the Zoom call, it was so important to show the, the meaning of the team. The wonderful Mickey Hatcher said, there were like eight or 10 of us on the Zoom call. You know, there are a lot of guys that contribute to this team that aren't on this call. So Mickey wasn't leaving anybody else. Kirk Gibson says, and I've heard him say it a number of times, and he means it. Anybody, any of us could have hit that home run in the first game. A la, whether it's Kiki Hernandez hmm. or Bellinger. Sure. Anyone. So that's what that team had was a togetherness not only that year but a lifetime uh, of, uh, of people with um, and they've proven it uh, in their own lives there's no more important part of a scouting report you have all the analytics you want and I've been involved in analytics I formed a company with my dear friend Ari Kaplan mm -hmm. so I know a chapter and verse most important part of a scouting report comes under the heading it can be C or MU, character or makeup. That is the most important part. And they, uh, and f being fortunate to bring in players like Kurt and, and Hatcher uh, and Shelby uh, and Belcher um, and others, and the players like Soch and Saxe and Oral, of course, and the others that were there. These people have shown in their lifetimes who they are, not who they were as players. And you know what's really remarkable? That I had the great honor to know Jackie and Pee Wee and Campy and Duke and Carl Erskine, a friend today. Um, uh, and Jim Gilliam, they, they were not just winning players. Yeah. These people uh, that were, were the best people that you could possibly surround yourself with. And um, so that, that's, um, uh, that's a blessing. Um, and that, that's why I'm so um, pleased to see uh, Dave as the manager and this team, because I really like the character of this team. That's what I relate to. I think the front office has done a Andrew Freeman and company, yeah. and he's got a large company there working yeah, for Yeah, he does. Yeah, right. big entourage there, absolutely. Uh, but uh, I think that, uh, I think they've done a marvelous job of uh, putting the, they, uh, two things, putting the team together, and putting it in the right hands. Yeah. Yeah, you obviously trust Dave and his and his ability to make decisions, not only as a leader, as we've talked about before this call and on this call a little bit, but in-game decisions as well. I know every manager gets questioned, why didn't, you know, I'm sure that if, if Julio would have given up two runs in the ninth inning last night, everybody would have said, why'd you bring in, why didn't you bring in Kenley? And if Kenley would have come in and given up two runs, why didn't you leave Julio in? And then, and well, that's, you know, you're going to be second guessed as a manager every last game. Last year at this time, Dave was being second guessed sure. by everyone when the Dodger season came to an end. Right. So I sent him a text and I think he, I'm sure he won't mind me sharing it. I said, Dave, in the season when your team set a record for a number of wins, when your players had many accomplishments, uh, I never once heard you take any credit. And I've always heard you to this day when the criticism is at its peak, take this responsibility. Yeah. I said, my greatest wish for you is that one day you will hold that World Series trophy uh, representing the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I feel about it. Yeah. I don't know the man and I feel the same way. All I know of him is what I see on, on TV and read in the, in the papers and, 
and talking to people like you and Charlie and others who know him so well, and they all say the same thing. You talked about something um, that I wanted to bring up, and it was in my notes, and you, you took it up there already, so we'll go there now. The, the, the culture, the chemistry, the leadership on that 88 team, do you see, and I, I think I know we're going to answer this, but I'd like to hear if there's any correlation between that 88 team and this team this year that maybe wasn't on the other teams for 32 years or – you know, I'm not saying they didn't have it two well, years ago or three years team, ago. All championship teams, of course, have, have leaders. And, and, um, uh, but I think one of the things about this team, and I, I think back in the, uh, a young writer from the uh, New York Times uh, called me recently. And uh, actually, uh, he had led off by saying that the Jonathan Abrams, I believe is his name, I should know, he led off by saying that uh, there's been a comparison of uh, Mookie to uh, Willie Mays. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I said, John, that, that's a big reach. That's I said, tough. Willie Mays is as good as it gets. Not that Mookie's that, that, on that, his that, way that, up. That's yeah. giving time. But, but the, the funny part about that, John and I have been exchanging text messages during the last three games. And it was the fifth game, looked like Mays. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, next game looked look a little bit more like Mays. And the last game, John just texted back and said, this is uncanny. Unreal. But here's the thing that's, uh, that's kind of interesting about this that people haven't written about. Dodgers had these young players come up in 69, uh, some success, and then the early 70s. But it was bringing in Jimmy Wynn in 74 that got them into the World Series. Mm -hmm. Just as it had been in 59 with the wonderful Maury Wills coming to the team, just as it had been in 65 when Lou Johnson coming up, not from outside the organization. And I really think without question that Mookie has been the catalyst. Mm -hmm. Not that the talent wasn't there. Clearly, they were in the World Series against sure. Mookie's team. Right. The talent has been there. But Mookie has made the difference. Mookie has become, without any question, you just have to watch the game. Yeah. He is the leader of this team. The team... And I didn't say this publicly, but in my own mind, that there needed to be someone emerging. And when you have a group of young players, it's not easy. Uh, Kirk clearly gave us that right. in 88, probably as the, the biggest demonstration of what one player can be. Uh, probably one of the few players to ever come into a team and be the most valuable player in that season. Right. But Mookie is such the perfect leader because he has talent but he takes joy in the success of all the other players so that there, there's a comparison there um for sure um but uh but he, he's been a difference maker and he, he clearly is a difference maker and that's not to take anything away from bellinger's game winning home run or justin turner's great play i mean right uh, this team with all the talent they just grind it out and yeah. they, they, uh, uh, they'll capitalize. You, you cannot make the mistakes the Braves made in base running because there right. were three major ones yeah. and least, get yeah. away with it with the Dodgers right. because they, they, they will beat you. And uh, this is not only an outstanding group of players. This is going to be a great team for a lot of years. And the lesson to – other teams, they know it. They're going to have to up their game. There's nothing better in the game than competition because this team's not going away. Right. I see Mookie as sort of that bridge between the younger generation and the older generation on the team, too, because you've got Clayton and Justin and those that are in their 30s. You've got these yeah. young kids that are the stars, yeah. and Mookie's and, and sitting Justin, there in the late and 20s. Justin has been so great. I, I have yeah. great respect for Justin. Me, too. He, uh, he's been tremendous. He, he's uh, taking nothing away from him. He's certainly been. It is a leader, truly, and is yeah. Uh, and the players refer to him as a leader as well. I heard yeah, he is. Yeah. yeah, 
what do you think that the, what are your thoughts on judge and his contract is up after this? And do you think uh, if you're the general manager of the Dodgers putting that hat back on, what are you doing with Justin after this season? What are you hoping? You know, I, I don't worry about that at all anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I was going to ask. It's real fun to just be a fan again, right? right? I'm not worried about the contracts. <laughs> I'm not worried about the trades. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you this. As a fan then, what are you hoping uh, to do? Uh, uh, if you want to feel the heat of that seat, yeah. And the contract that Mookie has, Ooh. think about what Bellinger is going to get, what Sager is going to get, and uh, what Bu uh, the pitcher Bueller is going to get. Yeah. And um, you got a big number. You, you do. Uh, and, and that doesn't even speak to everybody that's there. They, they've got uh, – uh, they, they've assembled a wonderful team, and they'll be deserving of their contracts. But as far as whether they should sign them or not, I'll leave that to the general managers and the fans to uh, be the jury. Yeah. Before I get into um, your journey and, and your, your battle with cancer and, and the treatment of City of Hope in the book, one more player question for you. One, a topic that has come up a lot in the postseason. You see some players who are just kind of average and they, they stay in the big leagues and then something happens in the playoffs and they just turn it up a notch. The Bucky Dents and the Mark Lemkes and the guys that, you know, had decent careers, but something about that post-game stage or post-season stage. And then you see the flip side. And I and, and I'm a I'm as big of a Clayton Kershaw fan as you're ever going to find, and and I will stand by him as a man and a player at all times. Do you see anything? I mean, Eleven wins. Obviously, he's had some success in the postseason as well, but certainly his his uh, shortcomings in the postseason have been well documented. Is there anything that you see or that you that, that stands out to you as to everything Joe? I see about Clayton Kershaw? I love. Me too. He can pitch for me any day, in any series, in any game. I could not have more respect for a, a player that I don't really know, that mm -hmm. I do. I don't know him as in terms of having that personal connection. It reminds me of when Don Sutton was going through a bad time. And they would ask uh, Walt Olson. Don was in a season where, where he was just struggling. And they said, well, Walt, are you, you know, going to remove him from the starting rotation? Hmm. He said, he's going to start four days from now, four days after that, four days after that, four days after that, and he's going to start as long as I'm the Dodger manager. That's when he's going to start. Yeah. And that's the kind of confidence and support. I, my hope is that Clayton wins the uh, clinching game of the World Series. That, that to me, would be the, uh, uh, the crowning uh, blow. Uh, Justin uh, Turner yeah. can hit the home run. There you go. Wins the game and, um, and raise the trophy. Yeah. No, I agree. And I know that we're going to, this podcast is going to actually air uh, on October 20th, which is tomorrow, which is day one of the World Series. And I, I haven't heard officially, but I'm sure Clayton's getting the ball on game one. Sure. Hope and, so. uh, yeah. And I agree. And I, yeah, I, I right there with you too. He's an amazing man. And, you just hope that he can pull it together and and uh, and have a, a Clayton Kershaw esque type of a game. Um, boy, we could stay on the World Series this year, but uh, I, I can't do this interview without now talking to you about your journey. You um, you obviously are representing City of Hope. Take us back to you know you had skin cancer and the diagnosis, and then you know I I know a lot of people had skin cancer and they go get it burned off and they're fine. That's obviously not where it went with you. Tell us about that journey and then how you well, got involved the, the, with City of Hope. Well, the journey uh, to City of Hope and, um, has been chronicled in the book, um, Fred Clare's uh, Extra Innings, uh, Fred Clare's Journey to City of Hope and Finding a uh, World Championship Team. Uh, and the book is uh, available on Amazon's. All net proceeds from uh, the book go to uh, City of Hope. So the, uh, I'll, I'll describe the journey, which continues to take place. Sure. Um, it really started in the most innocent of fashions with a small spot on my lip um, due to a lot of days in the sun. And even though I would put sunscreen on my face, and hands and so forth, can't say that I always protected my lip with uh, <laughs> sunscreen lip gloss, which, uh, um, it was one of the reasons why when cancer struck, um, I uh, was candid about it. I didn't run from it because I wanted others to be aware and thinking maybe in some small way. 
that I could help them about the dangers and using sunscreen and protecting your lips and protecting all parts of your body. But it, um, in uh, uh, 2016, uh, now more than uh, four years, I had a little small spot on my lip that very, was barely noticeable. Uh, and I went and see my dermatologist. Uh, it didn't seem like much, but she took a little biopsy and called me and said, uh, Fred, it's, uh, actually this was 2015, said it's uh, squamous cell carcinoma and uh, it's going to require a little surgery, small surgery um, by someone who uh, is expert in that area. And uh, so I went to see um, the, uh, the doctor that was recommended and had what's known as the Mohs procedure where they took it. It was only one, maybe two swipes, very small. Doctor felt we've got it, no problem. That was 2015, 2016. Uh, I had this pain in the side of my face and uh, I couldn't understand what it was. And after a number of MRIs, CAT scans, um, uh, revisiting with my uh, dentist, uh, uh, to see whether there was anything there that had happened. I couldn't understand this pain was getting greater by the day. And um, uh, finally, after um, a number of scans and MRIs, it was discovered that the cancer had moved from my lip into my jawbone and was headed north wow. um, on a fast pace and, uh, and a very dangerous cancer. So, um, in 2016, I went into City of Hope and they said, um, Fred, that um, one procedure would be that we could take a bone from your leg and replace your jawbone. And um, I said, wow. I said, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm 80 years old. I've been in great health. I'm really more and I'm being very candid here, I'm really more interested in quality of life than length of life. Sure. Uh, I've been very blessed. So we decided, the doctor decided that, a um, wonderful doctor, Dr. Gernon, that they could cut my throat, take the cancer out of my jawbone. I went through um, 33 radiations, seven chemos, and then um, things were looking great in January 2017. Went in to see Dr. Gernon, looked at me, and I felt wonderful. It looked like I was recovering. I said, Fred, I don't like this. There was a spot on my neck. The cancer had now moved into my neck, and I had to undergo um, immunotherapy. Um, and then um, fast forward a couple of years um, uh, until last year, uh, 2019 in August, the uh, all that I had been through, um, my jawbone was uh, destroyed. Hmm. Uh, and so now, July 31 of last year, um, I went in, City of Hope, three doctors, eight hours, removed the fibula bone from my left leg and replaced my jawbone. Wow. And, uh, so in the last year, um, I worked very hard um, in uh, recovering both from the bone being removed from my leg and um, my uh, jaw uh, uh, being not quite what it was, but still functional. And so I just feel very blessed uh, that uh, I've had great care. I've had great support. Um, so I know, um, I know that journey. I want to help others, and that's why we've had the golf tournaments. That's why we did the book. And then um, the next thing that I'm going to do and reach out for is I'm going to reach out to Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to do <laughs> Major League Baseball because I would like to see uh, sunscreen lotion dispensers in every Major League mall park. People sit there and sun, their skin, aren't always protected. Cancer is, um, 
an opponent that you have to prepare for, that you have to be ready for, and that you have to battle with all of your might. So uh, the reaction to extra innings, uh, I didn't want, when the, we made the agreement for the book, I said, this is not going to be a Fred book. That, that book was done some time ago. This has to be, I'll, I'll be the vehicle. This right, has got right. to be the City of Hope book and the importance of caregivers. And it's been so rewarding to see the reviews on Amazon and to have people come to me and said, Fred, I, I had no awareness of how great City of Hope is. And the other thing they say is that Fred Cheryl is a tremendous caregiver. So when you can end up with acknowledgement to City of Hope and the importance of caregivers, then, then, then we have had a good book and we have a good book and uh, hopefully a book that can uh, help others and um, somewhat of a confidential nature. I shared an email right. uh, with uh, you yesterday that came into me yesterday that was almost surreal that a Dodger fan couple is watching the Zoom call with the 88 Dodgers. Oral is kind enough hosting the show to mention the book, Extra Innings. The husband buys the book for his wife. Not any idea that he may be a victim of cancer. It's later, they get the book, start reading the book, then it's discovered that he has a problem in his throat and ends up at City Hope visiting with Dr. Gurnan, my doctor. Now, you can't make this stuff up. Probably wouldn't buy that script. No, yeah, no, yeah. I would never yeah. buy yeah. Uh, the story, but the thought, their, their email to me about what the book meant to them, that's a credit to the author, Tim Madigan. And I'm just so honored to be that Cheryl and I and my family is part of this little vehicle that's traveling down this road, kind of waving a banner, <laughs> City of Hope, be careful. Uh, because the work they do, not only in treating cancer and treating uh, diabetes and their bone marrow, and even uh, the wonderful work uh, by, by uh, their uh, disease doctor, Dr. Dadwald, on um, uh, infectious disease and being in uh, COVID-19 research. I, I, I said it, I, I was honored to be with the Dodgers, truly honored. I've never been with a greater team than the City of Hope. What correlations do you see there, the success that you had with the Dodgers? Uh, I and the see success many. There? I see, uh, that's a great question because when I was asked to speak at their leadership conference, um, I told um, the people there at City Hope and the president, Robert Stone, that uh, the, the uh, City of Hope and its leadership uh, is so much of what we try to do with the Dodgers in terms of being uh, inclusive and together and working together. And the thing about City of Hope and I said this to Robert Stoney, and he later asked if he could borrow the, the message, is that uh, I uh, said that a great pitching coach once told me something that I see here at City of Hope, because when you walk in, when you used to be able to walk in when visitors were allowed and, and yeah. there the signs and we care, pitching coach said, in terms of trying to get through to players, you have to show them that you care before you tell them what you know. And that's what City of Hope does. When you come in there, they're showing you that we care about you. And um, so um, the other interesting thing, and I haven't shared this, is that Barbara Stone asked me, said, Fred, when you know, with the Dodgers, a high profile organization, and you brought in a new person, 
how, how did you make that work that you're bringing in this talent? So how, 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 how is that piece going to fit? Kind of an appropriate question when you yeah. say it's related. Yeah. I said, Robert, the thing is, you, we as an organization have to have the philosophy that exists for us. That player has to fit our philosophy or he's not going to work. We can't fit his. We're not changing a philosophy for the player. We're, we're asking the player to understand who we are, what we are, what we believe in and what we do. And if you believe in what we're doing, then we can be together. And if you don't, so it's kind of fascinating. It doesn't make any difference whether it's a high profile doctor who came from some place with the greatest reputation in the world. It doesn't make any difference whether it's Mookie Betts. If he doesn't fit, right. he's not going to work. There's a culture that has and to be there. Dodgers, um, and um, certainly uh, all of them saw very early on that Mookie not only fit, he fits well enough to last another 12 years. Yeah, so, right away. Yeah, exactly. I think that's yeah. tremendous. So you talk about the book and the hope is that the proceeds, not the hope is, the proceeds do go to City of Hope. What's your, what, what is your hope? I'll, I'll, I'll play the play on words here for a moment with City of Hope. What is your, Fred Clare's hope that this book will do and how you've already talked about one story, but is there anything else that are ways that we can get involved? How can my listeners and viewers give and besides buying the book, what's the best way for them? Well, to I, I, I think, um, the exposure, uh, the, the funding uh, is, is important, uh, obviously, in buying the book. Sure. But, but more important than that funding that comes from a book sale, because there's not a lot of money in book sales, uh, right. clearly, is the awareness and the promotion uh, and the examination of City of Hope so that more people have that awareness, so that when more people um, uh, think of, of, of wh where they're going to be treated or, or, or what's there for them or how can they get better or wh where is their optimism and, 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 and recognize that City of Hope offers that. And, and not the only one, of course, but the uh, thing that I'm a big believer in, and it's covered in the book, is that I'm a huge believer in second opinions when you're dealing with cancer. And the book describes several cases of friends um, where I've had the opportunity uh, to be able to have them get a second opinion at City of Hope. And so in this case, it doesn't have to be huge numbers. We just have to be in a position to try to impact lives because it goes back to where we started in Jackie's words a life is not important except on the impact it has on other lives and when I think of those words uh, I think of the staff at the City of Hope because over the last now more than four years going on five years Cheryl and I I, I have two appointments this week, the, the, the fight never continues uh, through occupational therapy, through CAT scans, through all the things. Because when they twice cut your throat and uh, replace your jawbone, um, that's, um, uh, uh, that's not an easy journey. It's pretty significant. I, I, I feel so fortunate because um, uh, the, um, I, I know of others who haven't been as fortunate. So I, I have I have an obligation uh, and one that I cherish and welcome. And uh, it's now my uh, life's work. And I've been able to combine baseball and use that as a platform while having the enjoyment of it and uh, to do all that I can. Uh, and uh, when you have a chance to read the, um, uh, the, the, the book that you'll see that um, the relationship that I had with the dear friend Kevin Towers was so important mm -hmm. related to our uh, cancer journeys uh, because um, uh, Kevin's battle uh, 
uh, was much greater. He faced an impossible opponent, uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer to beat. We, we've got to find and funds from our golf tournament um, went to uh, the very area that impacted uh, and took Kevin's life. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was such, so wonderful to have Kelly Towers there uh, with us. So hey, KT was a young man. KT played baseball in college with a couple man, of my buddies, yeah. man, and gone all too soon. Uh, and uh, so we need, we don't ever want to forget, Kevin, we don't ever want to forget any of our loved ones. You don't have to be a baseball player, official, or anything else. Um, we need to, um, we need to be together, yeah. fight cancer, in the same way that we need to be together to fight the uh, current opponent that all of us have in COVID-19, um, to uh, respect one another, to join one another in the fight, to listen to the doctors, to listen to the science, to do the things that are the smart things to do, to wear a mask, to have social distancing, to have our hands and body as clean as we possibly can, to be together as a team, and as a team, we will win. But we have to win as a team. You know, your your friend uh, Bill Plaschke, LA Times writer, wrote the foreword for the book Extra Innings, and I love what he wrote in the foreword. He said, "This is far more than a baseball book. This is a humanity book." And now Bill has had his own battle. He yes, is he coming had. out of his battle with COVID this year, pretty yes. serious. He, I followed that journey with him, and he uh, yes. he's had had some struggles. So yeah, so that's I, I love that you're using the platform of baseball. You're using that. Uh, not, not fame. It's not a fame thing. Just your journey through baseball. I mean, the stories we started with Jackie Robinson through to Mookie Betts and Dave Roberts and Dusty Baker and so many. I can't talk to you for any period of time without asking you to talk about Vin Scully. I've got a book behind me, Pull Up a Chair, which is one of the many books of Vinny's. And Vinny's, well, uh, Vinny's the reason I'm a Dodger I'll fan. I'll tell you about Vinny. I um, have two messages uh, on my, that I save on my uh, voicemail, my iPhone. One came more than, well, I guess five years ago now. And, um, and it was from Vin, uh, that uh, I hear you're on the disabled list. <laughs> I, That's Vin. Uh, people have asked me about Vin. And, and Vin's uh, quote in the book was so rewarding for me because I think it's there that then he said that whatever Fred was involved with in baseball, uh, it doesn't stand up to what he's involved with now. So Vinny is always is spot on, point on, and with the best words and the best description. I think of Vinny and uh, the number of times I've been asked because the image is so great and people will ask me, is Vinny really that good, that wonderful? And I said, whatever you've read, hmm. whatever you've heard, he's better than that. Take it up a notch, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> that's what I've heard too. And, and, that's, and that's who he is. And uh, those of us who've been fortunate uh, to know Ben and Sandy and their family and to have them as lifelong friends, are indeed um, blessed. I heard Joe Davis, the new, not the new now, but the Dodger announcer on a, on a video recently talk about when he got a phone call, when he was hired to be the Dodger play-by-play -play guy, Joe, he said he got a phone call, he didn't recognize the number, it went to voicemail. A little while later, the phone rang again, same number, so he, he thought, well, I guess I should probably pick it up. And and uh, <laughs> I know, I guess Vinny left two messages and he goes, I can't believe I said, Vin Scully to voicemail and Vinny's message as well. You know, I just wanted to call to congratulate you, but I guess I'm over too. You know, it's just, <laughs> that's just his, I, I, I heard a great, uh, great story. I heard Vinny speak at a, at a function, a, a good dear friend of mine, Rich Cope, who worked for Lowry's Prime Rib for a number of years and just retired. Rich was kind enough to take me to an event a couple of years ago where Vinny spoke and it was just an open forum sitting up on a stage telling stories and Vinny, the, the event started, I won't even try to tell you any of the stories because I could never do it justice, but the event starts with Vinny just walking to the podium and then 45 minutes later after telling story after story and it was the fastest 45 minutes a lot like today with you this has gone by way too fast 
he then sat down and took questions. That was pretty neat. But uh, yeah, I've heard really great things. I've read, like I said, his book, Pull Up a Chair, which is about over my shoulder if you're watching um, and just listening to him. I, I was that, I was Southern California child, like everybody who had the transistor radio in the 60s and 70s, listening to Vinny. And, you know, I, I followed the Dodgers because I just love listening to Vince Scully. And I, I grew up on Garvey Lopes, Russell Say, Sutton, Yeager, Smith, Ferguson, and what an honor it is for me to, to get to meet a lot of them. And now to meet you, you were instrumental in putting that team together. I mean, you, you made the trade to bring Kurt Gibson to the Dodgers in 1988, really kind of right out of the, out of the gate. I, I, in a little bit of time we have left, I'd, I'd love to just briefly hear how does a guy who really was more in marketing and communications and PR suddenly become the GM of the Dodgers and then execute a trade that has brought us the only world championship we've had in the last 32 years. Well, I had, uh, uh, when uh, Peter O'Malley uh, asked me to take the position of, uh, of general manager, uh, I said to Peter that, uh, you know, that we were in a very difficult time. We won't take this show to go in all of that. But right. um, I said, I, Peter, if you want to form a committee, I'll be a part of a committee. But if you're asking me to take it, the one thing that uh, I just want to be clear of, and I know I will be, is that I have full total responsibility because in a baseball organization, that's what's needed. You, you, you have to have, take the responsibility, just as Dave takes the responsibility as the manager of the Dodgers. But I had been with the Dodgers for nearly 20 years when I became the general manager. Um, I had been, uh, because the front office was so incredibly small. I mean, I had had a chance to know, um, not only know Walt Alston, know him well, and all of his coaches, and all of our minor league people, and all of the scouts. These are people that I had known for 20 years. I knew who they were. I had had a passion for the game early on in my life, and loving the game. Knew my ability wouldn't, wouldn't um, get me past the junior college level, but knowing how much I cared and loved the uh, sports and loved baseball. So I was not um, really, uh, I, I knew that I was surrounded uh, by great people. Uh, and I knew that I would utilize those people. Uh, and, uh, and that's exactly what I did. I, I was comfortable. I didn't know how long I would have this responsibility, but I knew that I would give my very best to this every day. And so there was a lot to be done. My uh, uh, second full day on the job, I released Jerry Royce and signed Mickey Hatcher. So that was no, uh, Jerry was one of our highest paid players. Mickey had just been released by the Minnesota Twins. So it wasn't as if I thought, we, we needed uh, someone to come in and play third base. Bill Madlock had just gone on the disabled list. So I had known Mickey from the time that he was with the Dodgers before. So, you know, um, th this, uh, none of this was foreign territory. I knew all the other general managers. Uh, I, I knew the owners. I knew everyone in the game. So, um, and I knew that, um, that people were counting on me. Uh, and, and how important this role was. And that's why we won, when we won an 88, and it's there on YouTube or someplace, I was so looking forward to the chance to thank all of the people who had made it happen, all of our scouts, all of our minor league instructors, um, obviously our manager and coaches and players. I knew that this was, if we were going to succeed, this would be a team succeeding. And that's exactly um, what we did. So from the first day to the last, I loved every second of it. I loved every moment of it. Um, I never would have um, quit. Uh, they fired me. Uh, and they, because they, they knew me well enough to know that uh, I wasn't going to quit. Um, that That's not going to... Um, uh, to happen. I've never quit at anything in my life. Right. And I certainly wasn't going to quit at the position that I dearly loved uh, every day and every moment and, uh, and cherish those, um, 
memories. But you're still a Dodger. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I feel very fortunate and I feel very fortunate and to be, uh, you know, feel close to the team through my relationship with, uh, with Dave and all that he's done and, uh, and all the people. And because what I, and even when we honored the 88 team, I made a point to say, look, uh, it's wonderful that we're being honored. But I looked around that room. And I said, in so many words, let's not forget the players of 59. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget the players of 63. And let's not forget the players of 65. And let's not forget the players of 81. Yeah. Because this is who we are. We are not just a team. We are a continuation. We are building a legacy for this organization and they're not separated by years. They're a continuation. We will have good years. We will have bad years. But we, we will be the Dodgers. So see, to see the Dodgers, to get them back on the top of the world uh, would carry the greatest of meaning uh, to me. Because we, we were just, I was just one link in a chain of greatness. And I, I think about it a lot. I think about even at that um, uh, the the uh, the people who participated in our golf tournament to support City of Hope, and Ron Fairley driving from Palm mm -hmm. Springs to be with us, and Lou Johnson, bless his heart, yeah. um, being with us, and Jay Johnstone. Yeah, another good friend. Us. They're they're no longer with us, but right. you know what? It, they're Dodgers, and they will yeah. always be Dodgers. Yeah, I knew Jay well, and I was really, really saddened to hear of his passing just a few weeks ago. Really, really good friend. If you were to walk into the Dodger clubhouse tomorrow night or tonight when this airs, October 20th, game one, and, and give them a one-minute uh, motivation, what might you say? Um, well, he would <laughs> – much of what we couldn't repeat. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, but, but he uh, – I'll tell you, uh, it, it, would, it would really – it would be funny because the, the, the great strength of Jay uh, is keeping people loose and happy. And, uh, and, and let's not forget, he delivered a rather big hit in 1981, as he did, he did. many times. So it was so sad to see him uh, leave and, um, and have uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Um, but even when Jay was not feeling well at our um, last golf tournament, and again, what's fascinating because it all interwines is when he passed away, I got a email from Jeannie Lawrence, who for more than 30 years has worked at the Biller Center at City of Hope, where you uh, meet people and help them with arrangements and guide them through. And Jeannie told about being at our tournament and seated at the table with Jay and how much she and her son. So this whole thing for me with Dodgers, City of Hope and coming together, um, hopefully is um, uh, a blend that will be uh, beneficial for, for, for others because this is not a solo journey. Is the golf tournament still happening? I know we're in the COVID year of 19 yeah, or 2020. As, but. Soon as we put COVID in its place, which we will, yeah. we will put the golf tournament back in its uh, place. Well, I'll, I'm a golfer. I'll look forward to getting out great. and supporting that in one way or another. So great. that'd be look great. What's the uh, best way for people? I know you talked about the book is on Amazon, and we're going to post the link to that on the, on the notes for this podcast. Um, best well, way I'm, to... I'm pretty reachable on social media, either yeah. on uh, Twitter or on Facebook uh, or on uh, LinkedIn. And um, anyone um, who um, inquiring or for whatever help that, uh, that I can be, um, I'm happy to be. And uh, whatever support that can be given to Extra Innings, Fred Clare's Journey to City Hope and Finding a World Championship King will be meaningful to uh, to so many people well that's what we want to use this interview for obviously it's a it's a joy to talk with you and to hear your stories and i hope there's a part two to this conversation soon whether it's recorded or not but um predictions for the world series this year Dodgers. there you go uh, why, why not um 
well, who cares the number of games? Yeah, so exactly. Like, yeah, I, I keep seeing people put let, out there. What, people the saying, number, predict the, the score game. of the game tonight, and I just say Dodgers uh, win. Davis said it, and I, I believe it. Um, this is the year. Uh, it, it's time. There's, there's been too long of a, uh, of a gap here. Yeah. And, uh, and I think this is, um, this is the time, this is the year, and, um, uh, and I, I look forward uh, to that. So Fred, the, uh, thank you. The title of my podcast, as you know, is called From the Heart uh, for two reasons. Number one, my last name is Hart, so that was an easy title, title to come up with. But the purpose of the podcast is not necessarily to hear resumes and what's on the internet about somebody but more importantly and you just did an hour of sharing this so i'm almost asking you to just share right now in 30 seconds what you just did in an hour but i'm going to finish our time together today simply by asking fred claire what's in your heart what is um, in my heart um, is the feeling of being um, so blessed um, uh, in the life journey that I have had and uh, the opportunity to um, to be willing to uh, share whatever I can contribute um, to in, any and all because I know the uh, the greatest satisfaction uh, in my life um, has been able to uh, in whatever I've been able to do to um, to help others uh, in any way that I can. So that, that's, what, um, that's what drives me. That's what I'm passionate about. That's what gives me life and that's what gives me satisfaction.